Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Junaid Siddiqui and I am a movement disorder neurologist at MU Healthcare and I'm going to, talk, to be talking about uh, frequently asked questions that I encounter sometimes in the clinic when I, when I see Parkinson's disease patients. How does this change my life? Um, we know that Parkinson's disease is a gradually progressive neurodegenerative condition. That means with time things will accumulate uh, but we also know that this is very very slow as compared to other conditions. Um, so uh, we know that, uh, you know, so, so people can actually plan things ahead. Um, they can plan how to treat their symptoms and when to treat them and when to seek uh, medical care. We know that in the beginning, all the symptoms are uh, mild, uh, stiffness, slowness, perhaps tremor. And as the disease progresses, in about uh, a few years down the line, people start having dyskinesias, which are abnormal involuntary movements that can sometimes happen as a result of taking um, Parkinson medications. And uh, further down the line, people start having balance difficulties and a majority of patients end up having significant memory problems, um, but not all of them. So it's important to recognize this, this trajectory and when to intervene, when to seek help, when to start medications, and when to start you know, considering options like uh, like moving into assisted living, for example. So uh, in a way, it becomes more predictable um, uh, and how to plan your life ahead. So what is the difference between Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease? Uh, the way I explain this is when somebody has a headache, you know, the possible reasons why somebody may, have a, may be having a headache is maybe they have a migraine, they have, a, you know, bleeding in the brain, some tumor, high blood pressure, and, and the way to be sure if it is actually migraine or something else is by uh, you know, the, the medical provider asking more questions and then seeing how the response to medications is. So, so the, the point here is a lot of different things can cause headaches. The same thing with Parkinsonism. When I see a person who has a tremor, stiffness, slowness, and sometimes balance difficulties, they look like they have Parkinson's disease or they have Parkinsonism. But is it actually from Parkinson's disease or is it from an atypical condition like dementia with Lewy bodies, PSP, MSA, CBD, these are other atypical Parkinsonian disorders that can also present with Parkinsonism, but they behave differently in the long term. They have different trajectories, so to speak. Parkinsonism is how people present, but then uh, usually the uh, movement disorder specialists have more insight and expertise in trying to differentiate between Parkinson's disease and other atypical Parkinsonian disorders and it's sort of important to differentiate because uh, you know Parkinson's disease is perhaps the most desirable amongst all those conditions and the other atypical Parkinsonian disorders are a, a little more you know faster to progress so it's important to find out what you have in the beginning. So uh, can, can I still work? Well this is a very common question especially people um, since a lot of patients who have Parkinson's disease, they're usually either uh, still employed or about to retire when they, when they end up being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. It turns out that most patients continue to work for up to 10 years from the diagnosis. And uh, in, 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 a, in a study, adding a medication called antacapone to uh, Cinemet or carbidopa levodopa, uh, antacapone is a medication that prolongs the effect of Cinemet. Uh, this actually increased the employment duration by two years. And, uh, and of course, 50% of people are still working when, when they have di a diagnosis. Uh, but the majority want to continue to work as long as possible. Uh, most of the people who actually end up leaving work, they, 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 because of modifiable psychiatric symptoms, rather than motor issues, you know, you, you would imagine people are having tremor, stiffness, and slowness. That's actually preventing them from, from work. It's the other way around. People have anxiety, depression, other, uh, other uh, you know, neuropsychiatric symptoms that uh, actually lead them to decide that, okay, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit now or whatever. So, uh, so I think it's important to recognize when you start having these symptoms and to seek um, a movement disorder neurologist who can tease these things apart and, and perhaps try to address them uh, in conjunction with the psychiatrist if possible. So can caregivers come to the appointment well, we're concerned about exposure of our elderly and at-risk population of patients uh, to COVID. And, uh, and this, this exposure uh, can happen at, in the waiting area, uh, on the way to the hospital. So there are so many uh, risks 
of uh, being exposed to this. And especially, you know, not everybody you come in contact with who does not have symptoms uh, may, may not have the condition. So we know that there are a lot of asymptomatic carriers as well. So it would be, it would be best to actually ask ahead before coming for the appointment if, uh, if uh, a, a caregiver can accompany the patient or not. I think that would be the best policy at this time. What doctors deal with only Parkinson's disease? Well, movement disorder specialists like myself, um, movement disorder uh, specialists are neurologists who have further training in movement disorders uh, and Parkinson's disease care. And uh, um, like I have a two years fellowship in movement disorders um, and some of my colleagues also have the same thing here at MU. So it, it may, it, we, we are a good resource, I hope. Uh, earlier DBS and why some people, um, you know, um, talk about are proponents of earlier DBS as possible, uh, you know, including myself. Uh, there is evidence that deep brain stimulation improves independence, swallowing, and survival in Parkinson's disease. So, so this was a study uh, that sh that compared patients who who decided that they only want medications as treatment versus uh, people who decided medications plus DBS. And they followed these patients along, and it turned out that patients who actually had DBS, they were able to um, live independently for longer. They had better swallowing, and their survival was 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 you know longer as compared to people who just went for medications. Um, so, I don't think anybody can say that DBS modulates the disease, but we do know that as the disease progresses, people tend to uh, become less active. They start losing muscle mass. They have worsening balance and when that happens people tend to use a, a cane then a walk a walker then a wheelchair and once you are so advanced that you've lost that muscle mass and that balance it's it's virtually impossible to regain all of it um, even if you have dbs later on so the the point here is if you have dbs early on but you don't have any memory problems you don't have balance difficulties yet that may help you to sustain your physique for longer and perhaps uh, you know lead lead up to longer independence and and the, uh, the others um, and there is an ongoing study at Vanderbilt University Medical Center who are actually evaluating patients for earlier DBS uh, and I think this is promising. Um, freezing and why does it happen and how how to deal with it? Well, freezing is a very common um, symptom in advanced Parkinson's disease. Uh, it usually accompanies balance difficulties and executive decline. Uh, what happens in freezing is uh, patients uh, most commonly when they uh, stand up and they start to walk or they're turning or they are uh, they're um, moving through narrow spaces or uh, you know so these things can can cause them to suddenly stop walking uh, so unfortunately the legs stop moving but the the trunk the upper body does not and a lot of people end up falling from it and it's a, it's a major falls risk so what are the triggers for freezing? Like I mentioned, when you're starting to walk or when you're turning, but uh, approaching uh, you know, narrow, narrower spaces like doorways, laboratories, when, when you're stressed uh, and in certain rush situations, like hearing a knock on the door and then you feel compelled that you need to start walking toward the door, you don't know who it is, that's when you know, uh, it comes out. Uh, and sometimes uh, you know, when you're approaching a destination because that, that increases anxiety, and uh, for example, opening an elevator door, uh, and then now you want to make a, an effort to, okay, now I need to get into there, and other people may be waiting as well. So all those things can be triggers, uh, and, and it becomes more and more common and uh, unpredictable um, when freezing happens as the disease progresses. Um, usually it happens when the medications are wearing off so, uh, so people tend to have more stiffness and slowness along with it, but that's not always the case. Um, so you can try to prevent it by whenever walking, making an effort to pick your feet off the floor when you're walking, so as, an, as, a, as a habit. And when it actually happens, it strikes, you can abort it by you know, counting uh, one, two, three, for example, or using a laser pointer on the floor that you can you know, focus on on something else and then try to pick your feet off uh, the floor to walk over it and uh, or listen to a metronome for example that can also you know let you pace your legs to something else 
how can one be sure that they have or they do not have Parkinson's disease? That's a um, uh, you know, frequently asked question. Um, so like I mentioned before, whenever somebody has Parkinsonism, the, you know, the acronym TRAP, T is for tremor, R is for rigidity, A for akinesia or slowness, and P is for postural instability. You need three out of these four for Parkinsonism, and the commonest cause of Parkinsonism is Parkinson's disease. Now, if you are being seen by a, uh, a neurologist, perhaps a movement disorder neurologist, when we see that you have this picture of Parkinsonism, we know that you have Parkinsonism, and we know that you the commonest cause is Parkinson's disease. But there are certain red flags that we need to look for, like earlier falls, earlier blood pressure fluctuations, earlier memory difficulties. Whenever these things happen, uh, that should not be seen usually early on in Parkinson's disease, we tend to think that they may have an atypical Parkinsonian disorder like PSP, MSA, CBD, DLB. And um, so, um, so we have to you know, make sure that we take, you know, consider those things before telling that this is probably Parkinson's disease. Um, and, and, and then we follow patients along every six months, nine months, a year. And then, uh, so if it is Parkinson's disease, it, it, you know, it, it, it gets more and more prominent and more noticeable changes um, progressively happen. And at the end of the day, it is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, there's a scan called a DAT scan that can be supportive, but it's also positive not only for Parkinson's disease, but for other atypical Parkinsonian disorders as well. So uh, at the end, the, the most effective way is a, 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 a detailed history, examination and follow-up. If your loved one is uh, diagnosed with dementia, do you see a dementia doc or a movement disorders doc? Well, um, uh, when, when people have advanced Parkinson's disease and their symptoms uh, are becoming more and more prominent, initially you may be okay with seeing a general neurologist uh, who can manage those symptoms. But as the disease bec becomes more prominent, uh, more and more troublesome symptoms like orthostatic hypotension, uh, worsening constipation, memory problems, fluctuations, on-off phenomenon. A lot of different things start cropping up that perhaps will be better served by a movement disorder neurologist who has better insight and expertise in managing those conditions. But a lot of patients end up developing dementia and memory difficulties. Up 75 to 85% of patients actually have dementia as the disease progresses and there's an increased risk of dementia in Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, having said that, dementia itself can not only have memory problems, but also behavioral issues. And uh, it may be uh, useful to start seeing a, a dementia expert, a neuropsych neuropsychologist, a neuropsychiatrist, uh, in addition to a movement disorder. I don't think they're mutually exclusive because the dementia expert will be able to focus on the memory issues and the behavioral issues but what about the other Parkinsonian disorder issues? So I think you, you, may, you may be better served by seeing both, uh, but definitely stick to the movement disorder neurologist. Why do people experience temperature swings in Parkinson's disease? Is it Parkinson's disease or something else? And I have been asked this question a few times. Um, we know that when, when people have Parkinson's disease uh, and they're taking dopaminergic medications like Cinemet or Ropinerol, these medications increase the dopaminergic level in the, in the body, and then when the medication is wearing off, it comes down. We know that uh, the, these, the dopaminergic medications improve your stiffness, slowness, tremor. We also know that it has effect on non-motor symptoms, things that people don't see, uh, and like uh, you know their mood, their blood pressure, uh, their heart rates, uh, their mood. So a, a lot of things can actually fluctuate uh, in addition to the motor symptoms with dopaminergic medications. And one of them is actually uh, your, your sweating ability, your temperature sensation. So uh, I would not be surprised if this is a, a, an on-off phenomenon. And uh, one way to um, you know, put your finger on it is perhaps make, uh, track it and find out when it actually happens. Does it actually happen when the medication is wearing off, right before the next dose, or is it happening at the peak time of the when the medication seems to be working. Um, so th that may be one way of, of figuring that out as well. Restless legs for years and now restless body in Parkinson's disease, what can I take? Uh, so restless legs syndrome is, uh, 
is variably associated with Parkinson's disease. It's usually described as um, you know, inexplicable sensation in the legs, usually the lower part of the body, that uh, ends up happening in the evenings when people are resting, they're about to go to sleep, and it's not painful, and it always happens before you fall asleep. And, uh, and then mild movements of the legs or just being able to stand up and walk actually makes this sensation go away. And as soon as you get back in bed to go to sleep, it starts coming back, you know. Uh, but it doesn't usually wake people up from sleep and it's not usually painful. So that's restless leg syndrome. And it's very common. It's variably associated with Parkinson's disease. Some people argue, is it actually restless legs or something called akathisia? Akathisia is some, some, uh, like a motor restlessness of the body, and that's actually a, a sign in Parkinson's disease. And it's, um, it can be uh, from medications wearing off, or, um, or in general, Parkinson's disease patients may experience akathisia. It may be very difficult to, to differentiate between restless legs and akathisia, because people with akathisia will also have the sensation of, you know what, I just need to move around, like, uh, you know, but, but there's usually no, no, um, uh, symptom that is described before the akathisia usually. Um, increased saliva in Parkinson's disease and increased nasal discharge, is it the same thing or different? Well, we know that the production of saliva is the same in Parkinson's disease usually, uh, but people with Parkinson's disease tend to swallow less, so it tends to accumulate in their mouth and then they either have to swallow a, you know, a larger amount infrequently or it tends to drool and then you, they, they, they tend to you know, use a, a rag or something else to, to clean it. And uh, it's, it's easily treatable uh, by giving botulinum toxin injections in the salivary glands. Uh, but sometimes people have a runny nose and that is usually you know, embarrassing for the patient because it may worsen with eating as well. And this is also a, uh, a symptom of Parkinson's disease uh, and it can happen frequently. And is, but this is usually unrelated to medication or duration of the disease. Sensation of bugs crawling on the scalp in the morning uh, or waking up with a horrible taste in the mouth. This is also, uh, these are wearing off effect uh, and fluctuations in medication because uh, the last dose of Cinemet or Carbidopa Levodopa is usually at night before you go to sleep. And when you're sleeping for six hours, eight hours, you're actually, uh, the medication is now out of your system. And when you wake up in the morning, you start having these symptoms. When you take the medications, they, they go away. So these are wearing off uh, symptoms. Uh, psychosis and Parkinson's disease uh, treatment, how is the caregiver supposed to deal with it? Um, we know that Parkinson's disease, as it progresses, it causes more and more memory difficulties. Up to 85% of patients actually have dementia. When people have dementia, they not only have difficulty remembering and following conversations and remembering what, what was said just a few hours ago or minutes ago, they also have behavioral problems. They start having hallucinations, delusions in which they have fixed false belief, like somebody is watching me, somebody is following me, or you know, um, uh, delusions of infidelity. And that can be very, very um, troublesome, uh, not only for the patient, but also for the caregiver. Um, so, but l like everything else, there's a, usually a spectrum of symptoms. Uh, a lot of times that these symptoms are milder and they're, you know, just talking about something that is inconsequential. So what I would suggest is just gently reorient and if it's a trivial and inconsequential issue, you know, just, you, you don't have to, you know, ev not everything has to be corrected or, you know, you know you, actually this is this way and not that way. You don't have to, you know, um, you have to pick your battles, so to speak. And then um, more attention perhaps to more serious aspects, like people end up calling 911 because they suspect there's an intruder in the house um, or, or, or other significant delusions. Uh, and especially if there is like a firearm in the house and they're having, you know, thinking that somebody else is in the house. So that may, may need more attention. Orthostatic hypotension, should I take medications? Well, we know that orthostatic hypotension develops in one third of patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, uh, and it's symptomatic in even lower proportion of patients. That means uh, when I examine patients in Parkinson's disease clinic, I always ask my nurses to actually measure orthostatic vital signs, which I think is a very important to do. Uh, but a lot of times patients will have documented low blood pressure on standing up, but they won't have any symptoms. 
Um, so, uh, and this is diagnosed usually when a systolic blood pressure drops above 20 millimeters of mercury on standing up. And uh, we know um, so how, how to treat it if it, you know if, if it's symptomatic and if it's there already. You know, if they're on blood pressure medications to make sure that you reduce blood pressure medication dosages, increase fluid intake, increase salt intake. Uh, if that doesn't work, then use compression stockings. I prefer using thigh high compression stockings. And, and then if that doesn't work, you know, consider using medication like fludrocortisone, mydodrin, and, and a new medication called droxydopa. Uh, so a movement disorder neurologist versus other neurologists, whether or wh and when. Um, so we know that if somebody starts seeing a neurologist soon after uh, being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, the, the, um, the time lag between the first fall and diagnosis is actually increased. And um, so, so we know that there, there is a benefit of actually seeing a neurologist uh, as, uh, uh, you know, for care of this condition. And uh, we know that as the disease progresses and symptoms evolve, there are a lot more symptoms, uh, just not just phys you know just uh, uh, stiffness, slowness, and tremor, but also uh, worsening depression, anxiety, orthostatic hypotension, dyskinesias, medications wearing off, uh, complicated medication schedule, the the uh, the uh, the, uh, the variety of medications available, interventions available like deep brain stimulation, DIOPA. So uh, people, uh, neurologists who have uh, further expertise in movement disorders and fellowship trained in movement disorders, they are um, more abreast with, with these new developments and all the varieties of medications and options available. So it may be, you know, patients who are uh, initial uh, early Parkinson's disease perhaps can continue seeing a, um, uh, a, a general neurologist. But as the disease progresses, I would uh, recommend seeing at least, you know, regularly a movement disorder neurologist. I think that, that may be very helpful. Well, thank you so much for um, um, uh, attending this talk, and uh, uh, we'll be happy to uh, address anything in the future. Uh, once again, I'm um, Dr. Junaid Siddiqui. I'm a movement disorder neurologist uh, working with MU Healthcare.